Mm, I would like to give you an overview on what we are doing. Is, is audio working? Yeah, maybe I have to put it a little bit down. I'm not that tight. <laughs> um, on what we're doing in this task of the International Energy Agency. So it's, um, this is the short title, which we already called the long one. The long one would be the deep renovation of historic buildings towards lowest possible energy demand and CO2 emissions, in parentheses, and depth. Um, I am operating agent. This is an interesting role in such a um, <clears throat> program as the uh, International Energy Agency, because finally those projects are, those tasks are not like European projects, where you write a proposal, you um, have a consortium, you get the funding for what you um, propose to do, but it is effort sharing. So actually, the countries decide whether the theme is important for them and whether they send experts to that task. So my role is the one to um, coordinate contributions from 24 partners from 12 countries which bring in their expertise, which bring in their expertise mainly from running projects and so on. So what, um, what, what kind of brings us together, what links us? I think it's the vision that conservation of historic buildings and climate protections, these are not antagonisms, yeah? And um, as we saw also in the presentation before, well, I think 10 years ago, or maybe 15 years by now, I still had the feeling that in conservation circles there was a clear position, don't touch our buildings, when the first DBBD came out and all the things. Um, I saw a shift towards let's find the right solutions together. The fact that in 2013 you had a BHE Congress on the theme of energy was one of the signs in this direction, I think. In 2013, also ECOMOS established the Scientific Committee for Energy and Sustainability. In 2017, the SEN standard on improving energy performance of historic buildings uh, came out. And this is not a standard which comes from the group of standards on energy performance. No, this was an initiative of the Cultural Heritage uh, Technical Committee. So it's them promoting to be part of the process. If I now say historic buildings, what do I have in mind? Um, we follow in task 59 the standard uh, 16883, which says that it's not just the list, that it's not just the formally protected buildings, but it's all those buildings where which are worthy of preservation, which have elements which are characterizing the cultural heritage, which means that it's all types, it's all ages, um, yeah, and it goes far beyond protected buildings. When we wrote that NZEP in the work program for the task, we kind of followed um, also how it was interpreted in task 40 in EBC Annex 52 in terms of, okay, reduce the demand and cover what is remaining need by renewables, preferably on-site. And when we called it towards, or towards the lowest possible, um, this meant that we do not think that it does make sense to have an absolute threshold, an absolute limit for energy performance for our historic buildings, but that you find, have to find the best for each building. Um, I sometimes try and translate this with, don't stop thinking too early. Um, this is how we started into the project. Finally, in these two years, we have now been together. We have met several times. We also tried to look into this NZEP and lowest possible uh, with a little bit more um, concept and deepness. And we um, went back to say, okay, EPBD um, defines it as uh, NZEP buildings are those with a very high energy performance. And what is left as a demand should come from renewables, preferably on-site and nearby. Um, how this low amount of energy is quantified, is defined. 
um, how on-site, how nearby, uh, nearly is, uh, is defined, is finally left to the member states. So there is a lot of discussion going on, a lot of discussion also on national level has been there. Um, finally, for standard building, for new buildings, um, it, it's a discussion of cost optimal uh, analysis, finally. But does this development also fit for our historic buildings? Um, <clears throat> if, as task 59, we open up the definition of historic buildings and say, okay, it's not necessarily a formally listed building, but it is rather any building worth of preservation. This opens up also for more flexibility if we talk about energy retrofit measures. It kind of gives a um, negotiation space. And it means that um, conservation aspects, that's something we postulate, should also be taken into account in not formally listed buildings. And on the other hand side, it means that um, no measures should be ruled out beforehand, regardless of the level of protection. Now, there have already in the past been attempts to postulate um, such a negotiation space. Um, you maybe have, be, have come across this picture also earlier times, so which kind of says, okay, the more heritage value, the lower I think the possible energy efficiency might be. But finally, this is limiting in terms of it kind of induces that the more heritage value, the less energy efficiency automatically. And this means that some measures are discarded a priori. We thought that it might be better to define it as a changing negotiation space, to really point out that what can be done depends on the assessment of the single building and of the result to which a dialogue among the different stakeholders reaches. If you <clears throat> want to read more about that, we published that recently uh, in a journal paper, so you can also have all the context around. Now coming back um, to this partnership, to the experts, on the one hand side there are the, as said, let's say, three big European FP7 projects on energy efficiency in historic buildings. Thringheld was the one I wrote and <clears throat> finally won. Then Ephesus followed where we participated. Rebuilt, which is an interior installation where the coordinator is also sitting here in the audience and will give a presentation later. Um, add, I added here also the Spara Bevara program in Sweden, which is a dedicated funding program for historic buildings. But it's far more. So I think I tried to put here the logos of at least some of the projects the partners are working in and with which they contribute, but it's, it, it, it's for sure not at all um, <clears throat> comprehensive. Mm. <clears throat> the target audience um, we are aiming at is architects, consultants, building owners, users. So we decided to um, target who, is, who will be living there and who influences what we thought most what will be done. Um, <clears throat> and I think those two groups really need a very visual approach. So you will see that what we are doing is often related to visual communication. Um, we are still convinced that this communication um, we are targeting at um, is also helpful for national heritage or, uh, authorities, for developers, contractors, for policy makers. So we don't forget them, we also try to talk to them, to bring solutions to them. And when we saw all the themes we have there, all the projects which we can contribute and have synergies from and create new knowledge by bringing it together, we decided to structure the work in A, creating a knowledge base, B, looking at this multidisciplinary planning process. C, specifically look at conservation compatible retrofit solutions. And D, um, demonstrate, uh, yeah, demonstrate and disseminate what we have been seeing. So if in this first process, um, first subtask, um, 
the, the, the knowledge base, we thought to collect cases and to um, show best practice, um, we started the process of understanding how do we want to do that? What are the important parts? And this is something which we did for the knowledge base, but which finally influenced also the other subtasks a lot. Um, we understood that what we first want to do is to look at the building, to understand the architecture, to understand the heritage value of the building. This has to stay at the very beginning, and also when we present, we start with that. Then, to outline the aim and develop the overall concept for the intervention. And only after this has been cl is clear, we go to the level of the single solutions. It's important to look also at them. It's important to document them well to, so that others can understand what led to a specific decision, why a specific solution has been applied. Only this clear documentation helps replicate. But do never start from a predefined solution. This will limit you. This will limit you in the dialogue and it will finally prevent you to find the best solution for a building. When now the single partners went back and said, okay, now we are looking for best practice cases, um, in South Tyrol, our, um, one of our sources is this Bauernhauszeichnung. It's an award for uh, farmhouses. It is in place since 2013, and I would like to show you now um, the winner on 2016, which is one case which we have already also in our database and which you can see outside. Um, I would ask the technician now to start the video. Um, the organizers of this award um, produced such a video for each of the winners. <clears throat> interviewing both the owner and the architect so that you get them, um, you have to click on the uh, slide and then the website should start and you can start the video there. Okay. Also der Rheinhof ist erstmals erwähnt im Jahre 1590 circa und er ist seit äh, 1780 ungefähr in Besitz der Familie Taschler. Das heißt, seit seitdem geht die Verwandtschaftslinie Almengroder Linie weiter. Meine persönliche äh, Verbindung da zu dem Haus ist eigentlich äh, verbunden zu meinen Großeltern. Die haben äh, noch eine ziemliche Weile da gewohnt und mir als kleiner Kinder sein öfter Hergang und haben bei ihnen geschlafen. Das Haus weist eigentlich eine sehr große Vielfalt an Raumqualitäten auf. Es gibt helle, weiße Räume, es gibt dunkle, schwarze Räume. Also es hat eine sehr große Vielfalt. Auch die Materialien, die vorhanden waren, es sind alles, es kommen nur lokale Materialien vor. Und eigentlich war ziemlich schnell klar, dass das eigentlich äh, dieser Ort ist, den Menschen suchen, wenn sie möchten Urlaub machen, machen wenn sie angenehm wohnen möchten. Also es, wir waren uns da ziemlich schnell einig dass äh, dieses Haus sehr viel Potenzial hat. Man muss es nur etwas entrümpeln, etwas restaurieren, etwas auffrischen und kann sich dann auf, ein, auf wunderbare, schöne Räume freuen. Ich bin als ganz kleines Kind, habe ich zwar auch da geschlafen, kann ich mich nicht erinnern. Dann war ich noch ein Steige da drin, bevor wir noch in den Hof Augen gezogen sind. Äh, mit den Großeltern, wie gesagt, haben wir da schöne Erlebnisse gehabt. 
Die Rosfahrt ist ganz ein netter Erzähler geworden. Und da die Oma kann ich mich erinnern, wie wir in der Stube äh, gesessen sein, wie sie äh, Wolle gesponnen hat. Und äh, es war eigentlich ganz eine schöne Zeit, wo ich mich erinnern kann. Das Haus ist seit äh, ca. 15 Jahren leer gestanden. Äh, und ich habe lange schon überlegt, was ich mit dem Haus äh, dienen soll. Ich habe mich aber nie richtig äh, dran getraut, etwas zu dienen, äh, weil es recht da ziemlich aufwendig ist. Äh, ein Abriss ist für mich eigentlich nie in Frage gekommen, aber wegen meiner Verbindung da. Es ist für mich immer ein wichtiges Haus geworden, ein wichtiges Gebäude, wo ich meine äh, Kindheitserinnerungen auch ein bisschen drin habe. Ich habe noch mit äh, Gesprächen mit dem Architekt lange Gespräche geführt und er hat mir die verschiedenen Möglichkeiten auch gezeigt, was da äh, sein kann. Wir haben uns mit dem Denkmalamt abgesprochen, welche Möglichkeiten das sich bieten. Und äh, auch dadurch, dass man das für Urlaub auf dem Bauernhof adaptiert hat und äh, dass sich dadurch eine, eine zusätzliche Einnahmequelle, praktisch ein zweites Standbein, ergeben hat. Äh, hat mich natürlich auch dazu äh, motiviert und unterstützt in meiner Entscheidung, den Umbau umzugehen. Die Sanierung des denkmalgeschützten Hauses war eigentlich eine einmalige Chance, einmal für mich als Architekt, für den Bauherrn, vor allem auch aber für das Xiersatal aufzuzeigen, dass man ein altes, zum Teil auch im schlechten Zustand äh, befindliches Haus wunderbar sanieren kann und einer neuen Funktion zuführen kann. Die Zusammenarbeit mit dem Denkmalamt war sehr interessant und konstruktiv. Es gab mehrere Treffen, wobei im ersten Treffen die, Ziel, die Ziele festgelegt wurden, was ist möglich, was ist nicht möglich, wobei es dann schon die Aufgabe von Bauherren und Architekten ist, Lösungsvorschläge vorzubringen und dann gemeinsam mit dem Denkmalamt im Dialog zu überprüfen, ob das die richtigen Lösungen sind und ob sie für das bestehende Bauwerk geeignet sind oder nicht. Ich bin äh, mit dem Umbau sehr zufrieden. Ich bin der Meinung, dass es ganz gut gelungen ist. Wir haben äh, versucht, eine ehrliche Sache zu machen, oder es ist uns gelungen, eine ehrliche Sache zu machen. Die alten äh, Einrichtungen, äh, Täfelungen, Betten, äh, soweit sie gut erhalten gewesen sind, sind wieder eingebaut worden. Und äh, das, was neu geworden ist, ist wirklich neu. Also man hat nicht versucht, etwas Neues alt zu machen und dadurch zu schwindeln. Ich glaube, dass das ganz eine ehrliche Sache für mich ist, für die zukünftigen Generationen, aber auch, dass das die Gäste zu schätzen wissen. Okay, now back to the, to the presentation itself. What I like with these videos is that they finally show very well that it is not only a technical question, it's a societal challenge. Um, you might take the opportunity in the next days to look also at others of the videos. Finally, all the owners perceive the value of their buildings and are interested to keep this value. And this makes me optimistic that we can find the right solutions if we do it the right way. Mm. <clears throat> this is the explanation of the jury on why they chosen, have chosen it. Finally, because it is also a role model, for, role model for the valley where quite some old farmers had been lost in the years before because the extension is in a nice dialogue with the old. There were no superficial modernizations, but it was really an integration of what is there with a new use of the building. So 
if we look at this in terms of architecture, it's those stone walls in the um, uh, <clears throat> ground floor, the wooden parts upstairs, um, interior insulation, no, um, the, uh, the windows with the deep reveals to be kept, the Stube and also this um, Labe, this, this entrance hall with the walls where previously uh, the, the um, animals were also slaughtered to be kept in their characteristic. And finally, yeah, uh, these um, solutions were developed which allowed to keep the important mo um, um, aspects. I think I will not go into detail here. You can look at this afterwards in the uh, um, exhibition outside also. Um, uh, we do have 12 such historic farms over six years. Um, <clears throat> we might also document others in our database and our best practice cases. What are the selection criteria finally? Um, what we would like to collect in terms of experience is cases where the whole building has been renovated, not just a small part, not just something added, but looked at the overall in a holistic process that it had been aimed for a significant reduction in energy uh, <clears throat> consumption, deliberately no specific threshold. We don't believe that this is possible. Then that the project has actually been implemented, no plans, that the heritage, val heritage value has been assessed and respected, and that there is a kind of documentation of the technical solutions and, if possible, monitoring data available. Um, I showed you a farm. I showed you that we have more farms, but it's, of course, not only about farms. If you look here, I think the variety of buildings we are collecting from partners, from the other experts, is really huge. Um, <clears throat> what you also see here is the first evaluation of the Subtask A leader, Walter Hüttler, which he did one month ago, where he looked at, okay, which cases are already in, and is it residential buildings or not? Um, we see that it is mainly small buildings. Quite some of them at the moment are listed or in protection areas. Um, most are renovations, sometimes also with extensions. If you look at the blue part, uh, there is a variety of renewable energy sources which is considered. And also in terms of cost, internal climate, environmental information, I think we are quite complete. So this is a timeline he did where you see that uh, the oldest buildings we are at the moment documented are from before 1600 and it goes up to the mid of the last century. Um, this to show the variety of what we're looking for. Um, the two buildings here might be presented, I think, in the presentation tomorrow by Walter Hüttler. Uh, those of you who are from Vienna know them well. They were also examples of the Stadt der Zukunft project. And actually, I think it's nice that they were presented for the Staatspreis Architektur. I think it's a good opportunity also if such buildings get such an award because it gives visibility to our issue. Um, we would like to have the database connected. On the one hand side, at the moment, we are contributing with two projects, which means totally um, six, um, <clears throat> a, num uh, a lot of countries. Um, we hope that with this PRU project, we could reach a number of 100 examples. And this should be a good starting point for others to like what they see and add in future their own cases. So our vision is that others continue using this website. We will link it to other websites which do maybe in a more general way similar things. And we are also open to provide it to projects, to programs who would, use, would like to use it for their documentation. And the question to you, if you know a good example, get in touch with us. <laughs> How much time do you have? You're looking at the... Still fine? Okay. <laughs> um, this guiding through the process with architecture, process, and then the solution um, is also reflected in what we do in subtask B when it comes to analyze how the multidisciplinary planning works and which tools are used and how they can support the dialogue. And there we started from the standard I mentioned at the beginning, um, <clears throat> the standard uh, which is a guideline for improving the energy performance of historic buildings. This is not a standard which the, makes a decision for you. This is a standard 
which allows the user to make an informed decision. It kind of guides you through the whole planning process, describes what to think about when you initiate it, how to do the building survey, then not to forget to set the criteria and objectives, and then there comes a phase which might also be a little bit of iterative. You select measures, um, and the standard postulates to open your mind at that point. Start wide, and then restrict. Then find what fits your building. You put it to packages together, you see whether you reach what you wanted to reach, or you go back and relook at measures. And then you come to a decision. Um, the idea in the project was that we analyze on how the standard works in practice. It was, it's, it's there since 2017, so it's now two years, um, two and a half. So the idea was to understand why is it used, who uses it, how is it used, and that we as a task can provide to planning teams at their very beginning uh, the standard, and then we interview them on how it worked. It was not that easy. Um, finally, we saw that it is not yet used that much. And um, I will tell you afterwards what were our conclusions, both in terms of understanding why might that be, and what can we learn from those who actually used it. Um, I again add here a question, because I think that in this audience there might be some who are working on projects which are big enough that a standard like this could really be um, a good support in the process. Are you using the standard in one of your running projects? If you have one starting, we might still discuss with Subtask Leader B on whether um, we can provide you, even if we are in the project at halfway with the standard, so that you can test it. Um, yeah, let's see whether the timing would allow that. But going back to what we learned from those who used it and discussion with those who did not use it is that finally we are not yet used to this kind of process standards. We are more used to um, standards which give us thresholds and clear indications. So maybe what is missing for this standard is tools which support the single phases. And we think that from the projects the experts are working in, we can collect such tools and we can complement the conceptual parts of the standard with a number of tools, and this would be our goal. One of those tools we have been discussing uh, actually yesterday in our expert meeting is the responsible retrofit wheel from the Sustainable Building uh, Alliance in UK. Um, our expert Valentina Marincioni from UCL presented it to the group. This is a wheel which aims at providing information on interactions, interfaces, risks a measure could have on the building, especially if you look at it together with other measures. So what you finally do, you first set the context. You say whether the building is listed or not, in which area it is, it is a good condition or not. But it also asks you whether the user, for example, is an interested or not, because this finally influences the risks you will have to face, and you can then, for example, click on one of the solutions, and you get on the left, uh, on the right-hand side, more information on specific technical concerns, heritage um, concerns, energy concerns, and so on. Um, you can click into these and get specific information. And on the other hand side, in the circle, you see. Um, where there are interfaces with other measures, where there are interconnections. If you change a window, you should think about the connection to the wall, you should think about ventilation and all these things. Um, finally, what you get out of this is a num um, this short information links to further reading and uh, at the end um, a report for the measures you selected with this background information. Um, question in the group was, of course, is this replic replicable? And um, one of the comments uh, of our colleagues was, do not reinvent the wheel, because we saw that there is, for example, an experience in France where, um, in this case, it is Serama, our partner, uh, which in the Creva project, which 
um, creates a knowledge center, actually took the tool from STBA and translated it to the French context. This does not only mean that uh, it was translated literally from English to French, but it meant also adapted to a different context. So risk and assessments and these things differ from country to country. The background knowledge differs from country to country. Climate differs from country to country. Construction differs from country to country. But it shows that it was possible to do that work. And now, finally, we have the UK experience transferred to, <coughs> to France. Um, what we would finally also like to do in this subtask B is to bring all this information to end users and maybe also differentiate a bit. What is, is information for experts and what is information for more general stakeholders which need information also in an easier way. Um, we come now to subtask C. Again, I went back to this my um, slide I used at the entry. Um, where we had the architecture, no, the architecture, the renovation process, and then the solutions. Um, because finally, this is also reflected in subtask C, when it comes to understand which retrofit solutions are conservation compatible. Yes? No. Is it like that? No, actually, it's not like that. It depends on the building, and therefore, if we look, when we look at the solutions, it's always a description of the contents of the pros and cons, which, make, which makes it then usable for um, others. And if possible, we do link the solutions to cases where they have actually applied in historic buildings. This makes a solution much more believable to who will use it a second, a third, a fourth time if it has already been implemented. Um, we cannot look at everything, so I think there are plenty of technical solutions there. We thought to focus on four themes which we thought are uh, crucial for historic buildings. Windows, interior insulation, ventilation, solar integration, and um, then we have above that the concept of the retrofit strategy, and I would like to introduce um, what we have in mind when we say retrofit strategy, the project peer renewal um, <coughs> from Belgium, where uh, the, you see um, Leuven, Louvain, um, <coughs> I think it was the last expert meeting, gave us an introduction on what they are doing there. Finally, um, doing the project on national level makes it possible to look at different kinds of buildings, to categorize buildings, to select one typical building for each category, um, analyze it, understand this kind of building well, then look at uh, possible solutions and evaluate their impact specifically on the um, buildings, on the building typologies which had been identified, and then there come the retrofit strategies. So finally, what they pointed out is it's not a single measure you should evaluate. You should always evaluate a package of measures because they influence each other and you will understand what happens only if you look at them together on the one hand side. And this avoids also that you um, want to solve your issues with one single thing while a lot of small intervention maybe are better for you building than one big one. And what you see here in this chart is actually that combining the different things, you really can get a deep renovation. Um, for the solutions, if we look at them, if we present them, it means, okay, we have first to explain what is the solution, we have to explain why does it work, and uh, the single subgroup, the single experts in the subgroups uh, defined actually criteria um, for what, what are the criteria to look at for walls. For example, this would be Compatibility with conservation on the one hand side, it would be moisture safety, and the third criterion would be energy improvement to look at. The context is described and the pros and cons. Just to give you a little bit of images, what are the solutions coming up? Um, for example, for solar, um, <clears throat> we looked at the um, 
examples from the Swiss solar price. What you see here is <clears throat> the, 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 the solar panels, which actually, at least in terms of color, fit very well to the existing roof. Or an example on the um, town building, an example on the um, <clears throat> rural building. Um, ventilation, um, a next subject. The idea is, okay, um, what we need for historic buildings is on the one hand side maybe ventilation concept where we reduce the ductwork, so to impact less. One solution there might be this active overflow where I use the flow, the, mm, the, the central rooms in the flat just to bring the air there, and I do not need ductwork within, within the flat. I just can bring actively the... Um, <clears throat> air from one room to the other via the door or via an opening above the door. Mm. <coughs> uh, sorry, it was not, this is of course not the only solution. There are other uh, solutions too. We can think about wall integration, more often maybe window integration of ventilation solutions. Um, we can also think about the controlled natural ventilation. Why not? And I think in, 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 the, in the dialogue which we need for each case, maybe the engineer has the task to quantify, and then you have values to understand well um, what can be the best solution. And also aspects like a simulation-based control, sensor networks, and so on, can really help to improve situation in historic buildings. Um, <clears throat> If we talk about insulation, it will often be interior insulation, but not always. I brought here one example, which will also be in the best practice database. This was the uh, orangerie. Then it had been transferred to residential use, and uh, it was kind of brought back to the character, or nearer to the character of the orangerie. And here, finally, with the conservation office, um, a solution was developed where those parts which aesthetically did not interfere with the remaining part of the building. And those parts were anyway, due to reopening the windows and so on, the intervention on the facade was big, exterior insulation could be uh, done, and there were other parts where, uh, which were insulated from internally, uh, internally. I think there are other cases where external insulation is also an option for historic buildings, which might be courtyards and so on. And Mm, then there are a lot of cases where it's not an option. Just keep it wide and then decide for the single building what can be done. Um, what we will show here is, for example, a mineral wool solution which, with airtight layer, and um, you need in that case also the description of all the connections on how you uh, have to do them in order to have a safe solution. Um, what do you have uh, to do at the thermal bridges? How can you uh, solve these issues? So all these things um, should be documented together with the proposed solution. Uh, in that case, actually, we, had even, we have a monitoring system installed. What you see here is the uh, temperature profile in the wall, and what you also see is that this is uh, interior surface, this uh, interior air, this is the interior surface, this is the temperature here um, where we have the vapor tight, the vapor tight layer. And the temperature here at the old interface between the stone wall and the insulation system is the one here below. And what this stone wall finally, uh, what's, what's, what's their effect is that it balances out the um, outer temperatures, the, the, the daily changes. So what we want to bring is, as much as possible, measured data, monitored things, calculations. Um, windows, um, this is a building also in South Tyrol again, which had not been used for 40 years, which was in a quite good status considering that it was not used for 40 years. And finally, in this case, the owners, during the renovation process, um, started the process of protecting the building. So it was not that it was protected and the owner said, oh, what do I have to do now with my building? No, the owner envisaged uh, or wanted it to be protected because they saw the value and they found a solution where for the uh, windows which they had there, um, in the inner part, 
the single glazing was um, exchanged with a double glazing. Um, you had to adhere a little bit of um, wood and um, you have to make it airtight in this part. What are the advantages if we think about that? Um, here we will have higher surface temperatures, which means more comfort for who is living there, less condensation risk also if, you have, if you're cooking and things like that. Um, what you have to be aware of is that uh, here it should be tighter than here, so that this part here is more influenced by the outer air, which is dry. Otherwise, you might have condensation on this layer, which really stays cold. So we'll have really low temperatures there. Um, with this measure, finally, you can bring a U-value of this uh, old um, box-type window, which should be around 2.4, we calculated for that specific case, to half of it, to 1.2, 1, 1 which means it's, it's not, um, not a new window, but we go actually in that direction, and it means that what we lose as energy through the window is half as it was before. Now, um, if we collect all these solutions, um, how do we make them findable? Um, also here, we started from different experiences the partners had. Um, University of Innsbruck brought in their experience from the Netzwerk Alpines Bauern, where they actually developed a decision tree um, for, uh, for not historic buildings in that case, um, which then can led with different questions uh, a user to a specific solution, which is then described. Similar uh, approach in the peer renewal project in Belgium, which I mentioned also there, um, uh, with questions step by step, you are guided to what could be a solution for your case. It does not take a decision for you, but it kind of helps you in selecting the, the, the solution which might be suitable. Again, a question to the audience. Um, do you know conservation compatible and the breadth of its solutions? Get in touch with us. If maybe you are also a producer of something, get in touch with us. I think it is an opportunity to document well-working uh, <coughs> systems in our, in our databases. Um, and with this, I come towards the end. Um, we want to get out with this information. I think we are now a little bit above, uh, beyond half time. We are getting enough content information to share. Um, we try with every expert meeting to have also events with the stakeholders locally. We presented, for example, last year in Visby, at, uh, yeah, last year it was in Visby, at the European, uh, at the Energy Efficiency in Historic Buildings Conference. Um, we are today here. We will have that parallel uh, strange in the afternoon, and Walter Hüttler will again tomorrow talk a little bit about especially the role of research and renewable aspects. Um, the next um, Energy Efficiency in Historic Buildings conference will be in Benedict Boyon, so not far from here in 2020, date um, 7th, 8th of October next year. Um, this is still a not, ver not completely official information. The call, uh, the, the save the date and call for abstracts should go out next week. Um, if you're interested in the topic, that might be an interesting conference. We try to be present in policy events. What was a good experience for us was last week at the Renovate Europe Days in, in the Parliament. We contributed to their exhibition. We had the possibility to present the database and these are opportunities we like to use. And I close here with the traveling exhibition, which is actually kicked off uh, here today. Um, you maybe saw it already outside. Um, if you enter past the um, registration desk in front of you, you have these panels where we um, took information from the best practices we have collected up to now and brought it into these banner form in order to have a visual and at the same time informative um, yeah, presentation of our cases. Um, the idea is that this exhibition travels, that it is used in different occasions, both um, events our experts are organizing or events you are organizing. 
um, if you have energy days, if you have an event where you say, this is a topic, I would, I would like to have something visual and experience to discuss, um, contact us, book your slot. Um, at the moment, it looks like this, that uh, we are here um, in October. We will, with part of the exhibition, go to the Solar World Congress in Chile. In January, we, we will be at the uh, Hochschule in Coburg. In February, we will be in UK, in Stirling. In April, we will be in Louvain. In September, we will be in Izmir. So <clears throat> it, it starts traveling. But of course, uh, the slots are not the whole month each, so there is still place for uh, other opportunities. Just get in touch with us if you would be interested in a cooperation. And last but not least, if you're interested, if you would like to follow what we're doing, um, we try to be um, <clears throat> uh, active on social media. We have a newsletter. Um, <clears throat> uh, subscribe to that, uh, and you will get informed about all the new things which are coming up. <laughs> Oops. And with this, I would like to close and thank for the attention. Yeah.